5G potential. I know that um, 5G has come up an awful lot over the last um, couple of days so far, so it would be really interesting to hear from, from these experts on kind of where the industry stands, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are for 5G. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Noreen, who's from Tata Consultancy Services, and he will introduce the rest of the panellists. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. So uh, uh, without much ado, let me introduce my panel, uh, and then perhaps I'll give you a short intro on, on, on sort of to set a background in terms of what is 5G and how we see 5G. Uh, uh, without much ado, uh, Tim uh, from Cambridge Management Consulting, um, Anthony from Montrix, and Carolyn from Interconnection. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, so before we sort of get cracking on 5G and what 5G entails and so on, uh, I'll sort of I'll, uh, set a broader context of uh, what's happening in the world of 5G. This enormous buzz uh, that we see in the world of 5G. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you are Game of Thrones fans, but um, I mean, the, the most oft used, used quote in, in Game of Thrones is actually, um, winter is coming. So that's how we see 5G. I mean, uh, with all the great hype and promise, but still winter is coming. The reason is, uh, uh, a, the CapEx investments from operators are gaining steam, uh, close to 17, 8 to 20% of revenues uh, uh, is what an annual outlay on 5G is currently. With that said in mind, uh, the use cases, especially for the B2C side, is not pretty clear, apart from capacity, capacity, and more capacity. Um, you already see unlimited plans out there in the market, and uh, in our view, um, unlimited plans, with unlimited plans, essentially, you are drawing a line in sand. Uh, there's no differentiation beyond unlimited plans. Unlimited plans is perhaps the, the closest you can become uh, an utility. Uh, so B2C, the use cases are, are perhaps not very clear. And on the B2B side, uh, we strongly believe B2B is where uh, telcos potentially can make money. Um, uh, if you see all of 5G use cases, remote health, uh, connected car, smart factory, smart industry, smart cities, and so on, it's all B2C B use cases, not B2C. It's actually B2B is where telcos can make money. And what it takes to make money uh, essentially requires service innovation. Uh, telcos traditionally have been providing connectivity services, but to provide a smart industry or smart factory service requires a, a level of industry verticalization, which has hitherto not been seen within telcos and so on. Regulations are incre will increasingly play a role in terms of how 5G is shaping up. Uh, um, the regulations, which is currently fit for purpose, uh, set by Ofcom and Berwick, perhaps will not sit well in a 5G world with network slicing and so on. I mean, to put it bluntly, uh, network slicing would not be considered network neutral in a 5G world, according to the current regulations as it stands and so on. So in a very challenging regulatory environment where B2C use cases are not very clear, B2B uh, 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 monetization requires a different strategy from telcos and so on. How do we see uh, operators making sort of hay out of the sunshine? And increasingly, will uh, this be the winter that we are all fearing for, or will operators can sort of do something magic and get us out of the, uh, the trouble that we see? So without much ado, uh, let me head to the panel with that context in mind. Uh, I'll perhaps uh, start off with Carolyn um, uh, from Interconnection. So Carolyn, um, uh, what do you see are the biggest benefits of 5G? I mean, 5G, you know, it's a broad word that is being used and uh, given a chance 5G can even be, uh, 5G can even solve world hunger but naturally it can't. Uh, so what do you see are the critical benefits of 5G from an industry viewpoint? I hope this is working. Thank you. Uh, so I think compared to uh, the already, you know, one to the 4G which uh, we've, you know, we've seen in the last sort of 20 to 30 years, uh, 5G has become, or has, uh, I think, approached a very different type of opportunities, as you said, for the B2B market. So we're seeing uh, a completely change of focus from the 4G being a mainly B2C, uh, so people at home, you know, downloading films and so on, where the 5G is clearly uh, giving a potential to, uh, to the industry, to the enterprises. Uh, it's been called the new uh, industrial revolution, you know, 4.0. Uh, so uh, there is so much more behind the technology that 4G and the previous generations did not offer. 
uh, that I think um, we've just started to scratch the surface in terms of the, of the potential, uh, you know, in terms of different use cases, in terms of different verticals that can be addressed. But I think 5G today is associated with, as I said, the, the next technological revolution in, in the market, giving such a strong potential of digitalization for, for the enterprise. Um, that at the moment we just, you know, and, and those panels are very useful, but we just started to understand what the, what the potential is. So I think it's, you know, revenue projections, you know, by the Ericsons, by the Nokias and so on, I think are, are just barely scratching the surface. I think there's a, there's a lot coming down the road. And, and Anthony, if I may sort of uh, add a layer to the question, I mean, you come from looking at 5G from an infrastructure angle standpoint and so on. So uh, how would you see in 5G uh, and adjacent infrastructure developments coming into play? And do 5G alone deliver the promise or do, does it require a broader infrastructure development or uh, beyond 5G? Yes, um, I think it does. Uh, so uh, the 5G that we see today, the sort of first flush of 5G, is a, a kind of very light version. Uh, operators are basically upgrading their existing 4G sites using that footprint uh, on the basis that, you know, this new technology is not serving a lot of customers. I don't know how many people here ran to the shop to buy a 5G phone, uh, um, but, you know, there aren't many customers there, so it's a sort of a, a number of really sort of uh, early adopters that they're, that they're looking at. Um, so I think beyond, beyond this first flush of, of, uh, of upgrading existing sites, um, the amount of infrastructure that 5G is going to require, like full-blooded 5G, is really considerable. And, you know, lots of people talk about dark fiber and uh, the immense amount of dark fiber that's going to be needed. Um, a lot more sites and uh, a huge densification of sites, particularly small cells. So uh, maybe I'm saying that because that's what we do at Ontix, but, uh, but you know, very much uh, if you sort of read the story, um, Densifying networks with, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of small cells is meant to be a big part of it. Um, uh, and this is actually an incredibly challenging thing. You know, we're talking about uh, use cases that aren't particularly clear. We know that, you know, UK consumers are not mad keen on paying more for, uh, for their phones. Um, Operators have gotten used to a pretty grim diet, really, of having to upgrade the network every five, ten years and charge nothing more for it. Um, I think, uh, from you know, from from our perspective, I think operators first and foremost, even though the B2B use cases are new and offer new revenue streams and something a bit shiny and exciting, they're also several years away. I think a lot of them presume that you've already built this infrastructure and that it's great and that it's everywhere. Uh, so what do you do <laughs> before then? I think a lot of these use cases assume that, uh, that operators have tremendous expertise in these different verticals. So they're able to install huge systems in factories and mines and hospitals and, and, and whatever. Um, I think we have to be a little bit uh, realistic with this. This is some way away. And uh, it's an awful long time since a number of these operators have deployed hundreds, let alone thousands, of cells in a, in a year. The capability, you know, as well as the economics, the capability kind of just isn't there. So I think, um, yeah, slightly self-serving, but we see a huge future for shared infrastructure. We think that actually, uh, 5G, the business cases as they emerge, on almost any reading, um, it will be completely uneconomic for operators to carry on doing as they've done in the past, basically effectively building their own networks with the immense sort of duplication as they dig up the same road four times to, uh, to provide broadly identical coverage. So I think, uh, yeah, I think the, the I, I would agree that, you know, B2B is where 5G becomes unique. Um, I think B2C, though, is what we understand today. I think that's the reality that we've got to work with today. And I think, you know, uh, operators certainly look at it like that. And I think their first job in life is to use this uh, initial opportunity to provide capacity that they've got to provide anyway. 
I think the best possible use case for 5G is right here now today. If you're an operator and you know, you're seeing traffic doubling every two or three years, um, perhaps 5G can offer you a more effective way of, 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 of accommodating that huge growth in capacity than, uh, than previous technologies. And uh, so I think a combination of, of 5G, shared infrastructure, and some really, really boring things that get you no points at uh, conferences, but, um, but that are of immense practical benefit. Models and approaches for deploying these things at scale uh, on good economics. When we're talking about operators who haven't historically shared a lot of infrastructure, who don't have huge teams in-house ready to deploy tens of thousands of new sites. I think this is probably what 5G kind of really needs. And I think at the moment we're living in a little bit of a sort of uh, make-believe land where, where operators are announcing their new 5G networks, you know, every other week. Uh, and we might easily assume that it's all going to happen and it's all going to happen naturally. I just don't think it is all going to happen naturally. I think it's going to need quite a lot of uh, things bringing together, and I think it's going to need some fundamental changes in terms of boring old infrastructure, because we need a lot of it. Yep. But yeah, sorry, that was a, a long answer. <laughs> a short question, wasn't it? Um, and, and, and to Tim, uh, I mean, the, um, with 5G, we are seeing unprecedented scale. Uh, we're talking about scale, which is 10, 20 times more than what we see in 4G. Um, unprecedented capex rollouts, then again 10 to 15x uh, compared to 4G. Do telcos have the cost structures to drive, make money out of 5G? Yeah, I mean, in, in short, I think they do because they've done that in 4G and there's some um, good examples of that. I think if you look at, in the UK, how successful EE was on the back of being first to market with 4G and getting after that, really quite aggressively, they took significant market share as part of that, you know. And I, as a, as a consumer of EE services in the past, I moved a phone to EE so that I could use 4G in Cambridge um, when it was launched because where I lived, um, they were the only provider for quite some time. So they genuinely took market share. And so they have the, the smarts, if you like, intellectually to do that. But I think to Anthony's point, there's an order of magnitude different in scale. Um, you know, Vodafone, when they were first asked to predict how many 5G um, small cells would be required, um, came up with half a, half a million for London alone, um, which is just an obscene amount of infrastructure. Um, whether it's kind of unexciting old infrastructure <laughs> or, um, as we would, you know, um, claim exciting new infrastructure, it's a lot of infrastructure. Um, one of the fundamental issues, which I think you're alluding to, is um, the capex required for that is enormous. And most of the existing telcos, certainly those on the fixed side, are trying to deploy um, less capital. But the infrastructure investors, so those, I mean, like those that, that are backing Ontics, for example, want to do the exact opposite and deploy, you know, sensibly, but as much capital as they possibly can, um, learning from some of the tower companies and trying to translate that into a small cell environment, where there's a, I think there's an enormous potential. Um, you know, if you do believe some of the mobile operator numbers, um, which, which we do, um, and, and obviously I'm slightly biased because many consultancies <laughs> provided those numbers, um, but it's a huge amount of infrastructure. And I think to Anthony's point, that will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight for 4G. It'll probably take even longer for 5G. Um, and, but it's going to be quite exciting, definitely. Sorry, just to add to that. So I come from the other side. So I come from the mobility uh, sector. So if you look at the license cost just for the spectrum, uh, so for example, in Germany, the spectrum was over 6 billion uh, for 5G recently. Uh, the UK is about to do the same. Uh, talking to Vodafone as, uh, as an example, uh, they literally just recovered the cost of 4G licensing in the last couple of years. Um, so I agree with you in terms of this huge potential, but I think the, the potential will come from a different side to the uh, traditional MNOs. Um, because the MNOs, uh, you know, will have to deploy some sort of capex, quite a lot of it. And I think, as, as you both mentioned, the, 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 the potential will come from external companies to the traditional, sorry, traditional 
1 to 4G, which have been the MNOs and the dark fiber providers. There's going to be, as you mentioned, some external investment required, but not, not as we've known it so far. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it is going to be an enormous amount of investment. If you look at the contrast, though, so, you know, 5G, 4G was 20 billion in the UK across four carriers. You know, that will be a fraction of that price. So, you know, not even in real terms, in actual terms, you know, that is a massive reduction on the investment required initially. But I think so in terms of the spectrum, um, you know, per meg or gig, that's going to be significantly lower. But what will... Um, I think what will be very different is the investment in the infrastructure and also in the data center side, particularly when you look at edge, yeah. which we may come mm. onto at some point. Um, that infrastructure investment is going to be enormous. So the overall investment profile will probably be um, similar in terms of raw dollars, um, but the split of that between infrastructure, spectrum, and other services, I think, will change quite a bit. That's, um, that's our perspective. Anyway. Yeah. So I'll come back to the edge a little bit later, but I just want to pick up on Carolyn's point. Uh, do you then really see business benefit, perhaps shareholder benefit, by telcos claiming them into the Tavarco and the Servco where the Tavarco gets the asset, the capital, the ability to raise cheap funds to fuel the capex, whereas Servco focuses primarily on selling services, whatever it may be to consumers and so on. Do you think that is a, a, a popular business model we see Vodafone uh, embarking upon that journey? We see a couple in European market embarking upon the journey. Uh, start with Carolyn, perhaps uh, Tim and Anthony. Um, yeah, I, th I think, th again, I don't think it's very clear on, you know, what's going to happen. And to, to your point about edge, again, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to both, you know, equipment, equipment manufacturers, uh, you know, the MNOs, the fiber operators, the content providers, and all of them have got a very different idea of what edge is going to look like. Hmm. Um, you know, we're a data center provider, um, and, and a lot of people said, well, you're going to be obsolete in the next few years because Edge is going to become the tower. However, I can't think, uh, or I can't imagine a Netflix, for example, going and say, oh, I'm going to go to like four million, uh, you know, uh, cell towers in the US and as many, you know, in Europe. I, I don't think that's going to happen. So there's still a very unclear um, setting in terms of what the infrastructure is going to look like, what capex is going to be required, where the edge is going to sit, um, and and you know the whole of the model is still being worked out at the moment. So that that's what I think. Yeah, just to expand on that, I think making predictions is particularly <laughs> dangerous, um, especially when it comes to edge. And and I think you're wise to say that. Um, you know, we don't know how um, you know things are going to play out. Um, we also need to be quite imaginative. The amount of bandwidth we're going to get um, to a handset is obviously quite significant. And we've seen that, to Anthony's point, grow significantly um, in 4G. I did a speed test last week on, on one of the UK networks. I got 78 meg to a phone in central London in a very congested um, place, which is, which is pretty good. Um, and that's potentially a consumer broadband killing speed. Um, and, you know, We've all got examples of people who are now not taking fiber to the home, you know, canceling all of their home services in the consumer world because actually they don't need it. 4G is actually uh, replacing that, let alone what 5G will bring, you know. And so it's going to be massively disruptive. So making sort of predictions is a really, I think, a really hard thing to do at the moment. Um, the only thing we can be certain of is it'll be very different to what we expect. The use cases will be very different. So that's quite exciting, certainly from my angle. Yeah, I mean, Personally, I think Edge is sort of a few years out, and, uh, and absolutely, it's kind of interesting and right to, to talk about it now. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on which way it's going to go. I mean, if the point is that uh, operators need to provide super low latency uh, services. I mean, the other thing, if you sort of follow the story, is that there are also, there's a huge sort of skeptical community of people saying, who needs single digit millisecond latency? How many applications are there that really require that? And, you know, you can see Edge being important in a manufacturing context, you know, the uh, a car manufacturing plant and whatever. Uh, but for most of us, for most of the time, you know, we're not really looking at these exotic, uh, uh, more exotic use cases. 
practical industrial, most of us are, are looking at versions of what we've done before. And I think most of us are thinking it would be good if you know, 5G gave us something that uh, was more stable and but kind of game-changing level of capacity versus what we've seen before. And you know, perhaps consumers at that point will be able to do things that they, they can't do today. I guess sort of 4G kind of mopped up after 3G, didn't it really? Sort of, I guess we, 4G came along and it's generally, I think, regarded as a big success. But it didn't arrive with some kind of stupendous fanfare that you know your life is never going to be the same again. Uh, but it did very practically and capably kind of give us what we needed, and it basically cashed all the checks that were uncashed from the from the early days of 3G. Uh, I guess also you know life had moved on by the time of, of 4G. So I think the 3G auction in God, whenever it was, cast a long shadow. You know, so when we talk about these sort of huge numbers for uh, spectrum licenses, it's the money down the back of the sofa compared to the sort of the 3G auction yeah. that basically yeah. ruined, ruined, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, we still struggle from that mm. today. It's taken, you know, 15 years to basically build the infrastructure that was really required, uh, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, with Edge, I think it's a, it is, it's a really interesting concept. I think most of the most obvious use cases are probably industrial rather than uh, consumer. Uh, it would be great if they, they, they were. I mean, you know, you sort of see um, augmented reality, virtual reality kind of entertainment type services, and they need, you know, less than 15 milliseconds latency. I think all of that is going to be achievable, but achievable without Edge. You know, achievable with the kind of infrastructure that you know we're looking to roll out. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I wouldn't, you know, get too bent out of, out of shape about sort of the role and importance of Edge right now. I think, in a way, what we should probably worry about more is what happens next. You know, what happens in five years is definitely worth considering, and we should think about all of these things, and we should think about regulation and, and you know, uh, what kind of, what the use cases will look like and what the businesses will need to look like. I think, though, we've got a problem coming at us really, really soon, because I think if you sort of listen carefully to uh, the operators, they're a bit polite about the way that they say this, but they do generally sit at conferences like this and quietly explain to us that, you know what, this stuff isn't free. Uh, this is difficult to build. They are being asked regularly to basically magic rabbits out of hats, lots of rabbits out of lots of hats, <laughs> and expect no return for that. Um, and uh, and I, I, I guess no operator is going to want to sort of sit down and say, it doesn't make sense. You th you know, what do you think? Do you think we're mad? Uh, but they've got a huge challenge. And, uh, and I think in a way, rather than sort of thinking about edge and the role of edge, I think we've got a shorter term thing to worry about. How are we going to help these people do what we need them to do practically so that in five years time we can think about edge and, you know, fancy, spicy stuff, because I don't think we're going to get what we need now and what we need to kind of prepare the ground for that future day unless we see some significant kind of changes in, uh, on the infrastructure side. And, and each of you, I mean, um, alluded to an element of monetization. I just want to flip and ask you this question. Um, how do you think regulation is uh, going to either accelerate or impact uh, the whole uh, 5G monetization story? Uh, because as it stands, do you think it's beneficial? If not, what needs to change? Uh, um, yeah, I, so I don't know if there's a huge sort of uh, regulatory, kind of new regulatory sort of role that's required to sort of make this thing happen. I guess sort of the operators of, you know, they, they, they've seen a kind of the tough side of regulation with the regulation of roaming fees and if you look far enough back you know regulators have been very consumer focused they've had quite a big role in kind of regulating regulating tariffs more recently regulators have looked to um, help operators by changing some of the 
uh, laws that relate to kind of infrastructure and the rollout of infrastructure. I think they've probably been, you know, has that helped? Has that not helped? I must admit, uh, I haven't seen a whole load of new infrastructure being rolled out on the back of, you know, sort of the last couple of years of, of, of regulation. But arguably, you know, the, the, the regulator has looked to help. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't sort of see a huge positive or negative role for regulators, at least in the UK. Now, I'm selfish. I only think about the UK. It could be completely different in the States. It could be completely different in the rest of Europe. And I guess I'm sort of, you know, looking, about, <laughs> looking specifically at our patch, at our business and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, certainly, anyway, from a UK perspective, I don't see a huge kind of impact from uh, regulation. So. Yeah, just to pick up on that, I think from our side, uh, we have seen the EU uh, obviously being present across the whole of the EU footprint, more embracing the uh, the model, and I think there's more lobbying going on from the uh, MNOs and some of these operators, operators to say, we need to make sure that it becomes a financial success for all of us, otherwise we might not be existing in the next five years or ten years. Uh, so I think the EU has actually started to realise that it actually might make sense to help with digitalisation across the whole of Europe and bringing some of those countries that might be lacking behind uh, because of the infrastructure. Um, they've actually raised a, a consultation in the last few months uh, across the whole of the fo EU footprint on, you know, what do you think is needed, you know, what do you think 5G requires and so on. Uh, so I think the EU is, uh, well, at least on the, on the EU footprint, uh, is, is, is help, trying to help the, the, the whole of the monetization. I think the bigger challenge that we're going to have on the mon monetization side is the battle between who owns the end user, uh, between you know, who owns the content, who owns the end user. So the battles between you know, the, the big content providers and the end operators. Uh, as you said earlier on, the monetization between, uh, you know, I, I don't want to pay more for watching Netflix on my phone. However, Netflix, I'm sure, doesn't want to give Vodafone the rights to put other content for free. So I think that's the bigger issue than the regulators. Yeah, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, the EU is getting behind um, and doing some really good stuff, I think. Um, and hopefully, from a British perspective, that's something we'll continue to actively contribute to in a positive way. Um, that's my political statement of the day, anyway. <laughs> um, but it's, um, and it, you know, and the mobile roaming um, activity there was massively successful. And I think that's an area that is going to need continue um, or continued kind of activity and monitoring. If I give you one example, so um, I went to Greenland for a long weekend um, this summer from Iceland. My roaming bill was obscene just between the airport and getting to my hotel because I ac accidentally didn't switch my phone um, off, um, which is a schoolboy error. I'm not expecting any sympathy, <laughs> but it was obscene. One of my team for fun did a calculation um, for another conference we were at. Um, as to if I'd, have been, if I'd have hired an autonomous vehicle and if they'd have taken the maximum uh, data rate that's been predicted for running an autonomous vehicle over 5G for the long weekend that I was there, it was either the cost of hiring that vehicle just for the mobile, current mobile roaming data rates, I won't name the carrier, but it could probably have been any of them. I can't remember, it's either 1.2 billion or 1.2 trillion um, that would have been my mobile phone bill for the weekend. So, you know, there's going to be a bit of regulation there because, you know, not even my, um, you know, enormous salary would stretch to that kind <laughs> of uh, thing. You know, so, so there's going to have to be some regulatory aspect to that, but also there's going to have to be some enormous um, commercial models changing from the mobile operators because they're still in a kind of price per meg uh, mentality. You know, and even if they move to a price per gig mentality, actually all that's got to change. Um, and, and it will change naturally as it has done for 4G, but there's going to need to be a regulatory aspect to that almost certainly. Um, and then internationally, even more so obviously, you know, particularly when we look at um, Africa and Asia and some of the complexities there, what the OTTs want to do in terms of driving out content, it's going to be a really interesting role. Um, and from a consulting point of view, a massive opportunity in terms of regulatory <laughs> advice and guidance. Um, so that's going to be quite interesting. Yeah. So uh, perhaps the last one, round, round of last questions. Uh, each, to each of you, what is an exciting 5G use case from your standpoint, organizational, personal standpoint? What exactly is, what, what do you think is an exciting 5G use case next five years? 
a little bit crystal ball gazing, but it is what it is. Ladies <laughs> <Maybe Right>. first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, go on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I say there's no killer app today uh, that justifies 5G, sorry to be killing the, 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 the thing. So just to go back to the point I think we made is going to be B2B. So we, we've started to see, uh, you know, sort of how to reduce cost in existing infrastructure and existing operations of specific businesses. Uh, you know, so for example, one of the, the um, uh, people like DHL or TNT or whatever, you know, might might start tracking their trucks better, make better deliveries, uh, have 5G within their, their delivery uh, locations as well. That's what we see as the main uh, the main sort of 5G use use case going forward. Which vertical will win out of that? We, you know, we're talking about e-health as well. We're talking about, uh, you know, gaming. We're talking about there's, there's all sorts of different different options. So I would not put my smaller salary than Tim's uh, on gambling on which one is uh, is going to win forward. But I think looking at uh, autonomous vehicle as one option, looking at as I said e-health, looking at at those. I think there's a few of those that are going to be uh, driving it forward. Yeah, I think I'd be really excited to see um, a really good sort of example of a, of a HEP net that could support um, multiple use cases, multiple technologies. I'd like to see someone show us how we kind of build and deliver something that is categorically different from, from, from what we're used to today. So I guess most operators, you know, if you ask them, you know, sort of what's the performance of your network like during the busiest minute of the busiest hour of the day, they'll kind of cough and find a lot of very good ways of not actually <laughs> disclosing, you know, that kind of information and the idea that you would build and plan your network to provide a good quality of service during the busiest hour. Um, you have to be mad to do that. So, I, But I think that's really short-sighted. I think that immediately kind of means that, uh, that mobile services are not suitable for lots of business kind of critical uh, applications and also not suitable for lots of things that just plain old us need, you know. Um, so I'd like to see someone flip it, flip the economics and actually provide something kind of, Theresa, Theresa May would say, you know, strong and stable um, throughout the, <laughs> we forget about it, uh, throughout the, the whole day. And on top of that, you know, and I'd like to see sort of uh, different organizations as well as, um, as well as mobile operators. I'd like to see councils, I'd like to see landlords, I'd like to see businesses um, investing in a level of infrastructure uh, that gives them something uh, that differentiates them. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, really good public Wi-Fi. Um, uh, I think we're used to really not very good public Wi-Fi. I'd like to see really good public Wi-Fi. I think, you know, a city like London, uh, that could provide a huge benefit given the number of sort of Far Eastern US uh, visitors we'd have. But I'd like to see someone sort of uh, roll this out in a kind of technology neutral way, not just thinking about 5G for you know, an operator. I'd like to see someone roll this out because it's basically, it's the same stuff that we all need, you know, that all of these technologies and all of these use cases need. And so I think rather than just kind of necessarily thinking what will be the killer application that you know, you know, one might really sort of value today, I think even more than that, I'd like to see someone show us how you kind of create the conditions that make it worthwhile for someone to then come up with that killer application because there probably isn't much point at the moment if actually you know that your killer application is not going to be usable. I think the sort of the Googles of the world probably look at, uh, well, they do look at mobile and, uh, and they think that as an interface, this comes from the Stone Age. I mean, they're pretty insulting about <laughs> it, you know. As far as they're concerned, you know, there are a million things that you could do if only it wasn't for this bloody Stone Age interface that actually most of us are, are relying on. I think we get used to a relatively, you know, 
poor level of service mm -hmm. and I think we work around it and we're always looking for the Wi-Fi and we're always looking for, you know, oh, my data plan, oh, the coverage, oh, the, you know, I think if, uh, if someone really flipped it and made it fantastic, um, I think I wouldn't necessarily need one brilliant thing to do. I think actually that would kind of change things for me and if an operator could do that, I'd go to their shop and buy their phone, whatever it was. Tim, how can we make a yeah, Greenland echo, better? Echo that. I completely <laughs> agree. I mean, um, I think if um, if there's one thing I would love to see, because I think this is easier in a in a wireless world than it is in a in a fixed world, it is for 5G to really remove the digital divide. Um, I'd love to see infrastructure investors um, on one side pouring money into organisations like Ontix. I'd love to see MNOs. Um, you know, wholeheartedly embracing small cells and getting after it, investing in the backbone fiber that they need for consistency, which the Colts and EU networks and Zeos of this world will be delighted about, but so that they can roll out more of this guy's stuff, you know, to bring 5G properly to the whole country, um, you know, and, and internationally, you know, really consistently. You know, we've seen incredible things in Africa and India, for example, um, with 4G. Um, you know, we can see even more with 5G, which will be fantastic. Um, so very, very keen to see that happening. And um, we've got a project at the moment in, in, in Bristol, for example, that we're doing from a consulting point of view with the council. And they've been held up as the smartest city in the UK by, um, by many. But the digital divide there, if you look at some of the richer and poorer parts of that city between Clifton and Knoll, for example, is breathtaking. You know, there's people there who just still can't get, you know, virtually any form of broadband and afford it. You know, I'm desperately hoping 5G will, um, will remove that um, and give everybody access to, you know, better healthcare, better education, et cetera. It sounds trite, but I do think that can happen with 5G if there's the level of investment, um, you know, from the MNOs on one side and uh, from the infrastructure investors on the other. And organizations like Ontix are allowed to flourish and can really expand. Um, so that's my perspective. Cool. So perhaps I have a couple of minutes. Um, any, I can squeeze in one question. Any questions? Yeah, please. You had the question, sir? Alex Williamson, Next Gen Access. I have a question about the convergence of uh, fibre to the home rollout and, and 5G ready fibre network. So the fibre to the home. Council Europe reckon that uh, significant savings can be achieved if uh, the two happen in parallel. In fact, I've just done a quick Google and found out that their view is that um, incrementally it will cost um, between 0.4% and 7.2% more to deploy a 5G ready fibre network at the same time as deploying a fibre to the home network. And seeing as we are in the process of gearing up to deliver a full fibre network on behalf of Boris by 2025, what plans um, do you think should be in place to ensure that it captures that, that, that kind of economy. Yeah, I think you, you have to hop over the mic here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right. We need both to happen in parallel, without a doubt. Um, you know, we want as much fiber as possible, um, because again, to deliver, as you well know, better than most, uh, to deliver the fiber in the home, you need it in the backbone. And um, whichever way things play out, we're gonna need enormous amounts of additional fiber, um, you know, um, in the ground to support 5G. Um, so I think both have gotta happen hard in parallel. Um, you know, the MNLs will fight. Um, I think we'll see a lot more convergence in, um, in people offering both you know, like the Vodafone City Fibre deal, we'll see a lot more of these organizations, you know, driving both very hard to see how things play out. Um, so yeah, both is my simple answer, I guess. Yeah, um, it's interesting with, with fiber because, you know, a lot of uh, mobile operators particularly would say that we, you know, they, we need dark fi they need dark fiber, I need dark fiber, and there isn't a, a, a real market for dark fiber in the UK. BT don't want to sell it, you know, maybe eventually they'll be, dragged kicking and screaming to a position where they do need to, to sell it. But, you know, it's not just BT that uh, aren't massively keen on, on selling dark fiber. Um, so I think, you know, maybe there's a role, maybe, maybe we do need the regulator here. Maybe there's a, a role here that we need to kind of mandate uh, uh, dark fiber. I think um, the thing that I um, sort of find quite strange is that there isn't that much talk in the UK um, about fixed wireless access. 
So you kind of hear quite a lot of it from states and Verizon have kind of said that actually that is the first use case for 5G, is fixed wireless access. Now, I guess they're in a particular situation. They're basically rolling out a 5G network using kind of quite high frequency millimeter wave type spectrum. Um, so, you know, maybe they're in a slightly different position. Maybe things make more sense to them than might make sense to kind of UK operators. But here it's really only three that have, uh, that have kind of gone gone big on that. I think with um, Boris and his kind of crazy 2025 talk, I know it didn't notice actually, it's gone from being, you know, we need fiber to every home by 2025 now to being, we need gigabit capable or something, you know, it's now technology neutral. I think someone has poked him in the chest and said, look, mate, you're not going to have that. You know, we need, we're going to need different solutions. Uh, we're going to need more tools in the toolbox. And, and, and so I think there's probably a really big role for fixed wireless access yeah. as well. But yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, we, you know, I think we've needed more fiber for a while. I think we've needed more dark fiber for a while. I think the, uh, we don't have enough dark fiber available. I think the products that, you know, uh, BT are being increasingly pushed into opening up their ducts. Um, which I think is probably a good idea, but to be honest, it's not an easy thing to kind of use BT's ducts, many of which are already full, thank you very much, and then, you know, it's not an easy process, but I think there, there is the beginnings of a way, I think we probably, actually, to make this really happen, I think probably Ofcom does have to step in and mandate that BT sell dark fibre, and then I think actually the whole market would move forward. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a much bigger role um, for high capacity um, sort of microwave links. I think the idea that, that, that everyone and every location needs fiber is just unfeasible. You know, we're gonna be sort of digging up everything all of the time for a decade in order to, uh, to, to achieve this. Yeah, uh, I mean, probably 30 seconds. Just one last point, yeah, yeah. so I, th I think that's why we've seen a difference between the US and Europe in terms of 5G deployment. Uh, as you mentioned, Verizon are investing 1.2 billion, if I remember the exact number, uh, across the next three years, uh, investing in dark fiber, pure dark fiber rollout to support the 5G network. I think what we've seen in Europe is more based on radio access compared to, um, to, to dark fiber. However, I think there's a, there's a third technology that we're not really talking about at the moment, which is coming in play hopefully in the next couple of years, which is satellite access. Um, so we've been working on a, on a couple of projects with some, you know, some of the satellite players, uh, some of the LEO, so low Earth orbit, who are going to be covering all the dark fiber gaps, uh, being in the UK, being in Poland, being in Germany, so all the underserved areas, as you mentioned, uh, places like Wales or... Iceland, Greenland, whatever, you know, it costs a lot of money to get, uh, to get roaming. Uh, but I think there's, there's hopefully a gap that's going to be plugged there with some other technology that's going to come in the background. We don't really know the cost yet because that's not happened in Europe yet. They've started to roll that out in the US. Uh, but I guess that's going to be the, the, the next gap filler, hopefully, for, uh, for Europe going forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I'm completely run out of time. Uh, thank you, my fellow co-panelists, and thank you all.